Oh my. Here we go. All right. So, it was Chicago, and the year was 1893. To put this in context for you, 1893 was the very first year that the gasoline-fueled automobile was invented. It would be another 10 years before the first airplane was invented. On the streets of Chicago in 1893, it was still the Victorian era. So think about those period piece movies, you know, where you would see on the streets um, the women in the typical Victorian era costumes, the big hats and the blouses up to here with the long skirts to the ground, and the men would wear the black top hats and coats with tails. So September of that year was the very first parliament of the world's religions in Chicago. And a Hindu Swami named Vivekananda made great sacrifices to travel all the way from India to speak at that parliament. And in doing so, one could argue that he changed the course of religious history. He began his speech. Brothers and sisters of America, to which he received a two-minute standing ovation by the 7,000 people who were there in attendance. Not that many people in Chicago, Illinois, had been exposed to a Hindu swami all the way from India, much less one calling them his brothers and sisters of America. He said, I'm proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance, speaking of Hinduism. He continued, we believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. This is 1893. I am proud to belong to a nation, he said, which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations on earth. He went on, the present convention, which is one of the most august assemblies ever held, is in itself a vindication, a declaration to the world of the wonderful doctrine preached in the Gita, where it is written, Whosoever comes to me through whatsoever form, I reach them. All are struggling through paths which in the end lead to me. <clears throat> Vivekananda went on, the Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor is a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian, but each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve their individuality and grow according to their own law of growth. He concluded with, if the parliament of religions has shown anything to the world, it is this. It has proved to the world that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any one church in the world, and that any system who has produced men and women of the most exalted character. In the face of this evidence, if anybody dreams of the exclusive survival of their own religion and the destruction of others, I pity them from the bottom of my heart and point out to them that upon the banner of every religion, he said, will soon be written in spite of resistance, help and not fight assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not dissension. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda spoke those words 126 years ago. And today, as we celebrate our interfaith holiday season that we mentioned early today, we're honoring the Gita Jayani, which is the holiday where all Hindus all over the world celebrate the birth of the ancient sacred Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita, which means the song of God, is a multi-layered story that ultimately is a guide to spiritual self-discovery and the realization 
of the power of the divine indwelling presence in each of us. I get so excited about the intersection between Hinduism and New Thought. I'll be talking a lot more about this in my New Thought and World Religion class later, uh, coming up in a few weeks. But what I know and what my, my experience is, is that I don't think we talk enough about the ancient wisdom in our New Thought teaching, and so I want to bring that to you today. The Bhagavad Gita is the only book Thoreau brought with him to Walden Pond. And it is largely responsible for the concepts in Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, The Oversoul which deeply influenced the New Thought writings of Ernest Holmes. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that he owed a magnificent day to the Bhagavad Gita and that reading it was as if some large, serene, ancient intelligence had pondered and answered the questions that trouble us. Ernest Holmes said that the Gita was among the most beautiful spiritual works he had ever read. His exquisite piece, if you are familiar with it, The Voice Celestial, which he co-wrote with his brother Fenwick, was a direct tribute to the Gita. It's actually written in 18 chapters with four characters and is in the very same narrative as the Gita. It was that meaningful to him. We consider ourselves New Thought Ancient Wisdom. So, for your awareness, Hinduism the ancient wisdom, is considered the mother of all religions. It's actually the thir third most popular religion in the world following Christianity and Islam. We have about two billion or so adherents to Hinduism across the world. It goes back between eight to 12,000 years. So to put that in perspective, Christianity is about 2,000 years old, just to give you a sense of that. So here's a snippet of what this ancient tradition has given us. The concept of reincarnation, the concept that thoughts, attitudes, and choices determine one's life. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hinduism gave us yoga, mantras, chakras, meditation, dharma, the higher self, kundalini, prana, avatars, the divine mother, the sacred word om, practices such as spiritual and ethical vegetarianism. It gave us cremation. And my personal favorite, it gave us the namaste blessing. But wait, it gets better. Hinduism vehemently rejects any kind of dogma. So I like to think that they set the trend for spiritual and not religious. <laughs> Hindus believe that all religions are expressions of the divine truth, that everyone is divine and already one with God, even if they are unaware of it. Being so pluralistic and tolerant of diversity, it follows then that India was the birthplace of some of the greatest religions in the world. In addition to Hinduism, she birthed Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. And one of the overarching themes and patterns that you will find when you study Hinduism is kindness. It's a message of kindness to all of us throughout the ages. India's long history is a testimony to its tolerance of religious diversity. For those of you who may not know, Christianity was accepted in India long before it became popular in the West. Judaism came to India after the Jews were expelled from their homeland and their temple was destroyed by the Romans. And it is believed that India is possibly the only country where Jewish immigrants were not persecuted. Zoroastrianism and Baha'ism arrived safely in India after religious persecution took them out of Iran. And when they were forced to flee from Tibet in 1959, India welcomed the beloved 14th Dalai Lama and over 100,000 Tibetans. So, really, we have the inclusive, welcoming nature of Hinduism to thank for the birth and the survival of so many world faith traditions. 
including ours, as well as the concept of universal oneness and the idea of the indwelling divinity within humankind and all of life, which happens to be the very foundation of our philosophy here in New Thought. So I have a friend, and her name is Shilpi Dandavadi. She is a practitioner in our movement who grew up in India. Hi, Shilpi, if you're watching, give your sweet husband Kumar a hug for me. Kumar is also a practitioner. She tells a story of growing up in India in this truly pluralistic society that honored all paths to God. So much so that she lived in a certain neighborhood, an area where there were schools, religious schools of all different kinds in a very close proximity. Um, you know, Christian and Jewish and Buddhist and Sikh and Hindu, and they were, they were all within walking distance of each other. And she jokes that as a kid, it was really, really cool because not only did she get her religious holidays off, but she got all of their religious holidays off and they would spend it together. Think about that for a second. You know, I grew up Catholic and I can only imagine what it would have been like if I had had the opportunity to share Catholic holidays with my Jewish friends and their high holy days and Ramadan and Easter, I mean, think about that idea. That was their normal in India for Shilpi, and I find that to be extraordinarily kind. Celebrating religious and cultural t traditions other than our own brings peace to the planet. Celebrating religious and cultural traditions other than our own brings more peace to the planet. And just know that today at our community meeting, I'm gonna be sharing with you how as a community we are going to do that together. So I'm very excited to share that with you. Talking today about inclusivity and honoring all paths to God, I would be remiss if I'd, I did not mention the heartbreaking shooting that happened in Jersey City earlier this week. It was an anti-Semitic hate crime, and hate crimes like that are the cruel cowardice practices of exclusivity. And you know, as I thought about this more deeply and I thought about what we were gonna be sharing today, it reminded me of a very important way that we can together be truly inclusive. And one of the ways that I believe we as a community, community can step into a deeper sense of inclusivity is to include as a matter of practice in our prayer work, not only those who have been impacted by violence, either physically or emotionally, but also, and this can be a challenging piece, to include those who have enacted the violence. Harder to do, but so very crucial to creating more love and peace on the planet. Spiritual teacher Matt Kahn said of the Jersey shooting, may the souls of the perpetrators be transformed. May the lineage be healed. May all victims be healed. And may we live on a planet where we don't need darkness to inspire our light. We do not need darkness to inspire our light. So I invite you this week to include in your spiritual practice sending love to those who hurt others. Can we take a moment and just take a breath and just anchor this in our body temple right here and allow the high vibration of love that we are right here to be a beacon of light to not only those who have been hurt by violence, but those who have caused the violence. Allow this love, this high vibration of love to be with both. Just feel this love moving out from this place to any place that is calling for it. Peace, peace, and more peace. 
and so it is. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is the next step of our work consciously as a community. And as we begin to build our interfaith altar this week, as we just experienced a little bit earlier in the service, Arvin shared such a very beautiful, powerful Hindu belief uh, in, one of, in his reading. And one of the most famous statements of the Upanishads, which is another sacred text, is Tatvamasi. Tatvamasi, which in Sanskrit means thou art that. And we in our teaching experience this and express this as I am that I am. Thou art that. You are God. You are Godness. We are Godness. My daughter Flynn, who's getting on a plane to come stay with me for a month from college, is Godness. <laughs> Yay, Flynnie. We are Godness. The trees, the puppies, the love, the light, all of it is Godness, is of God. No exceptions whatsoever. And when we can remember that, we can more easily pray for those who cause harm. Because they are that as well, deep within them whether they know it or not. And when we remember this, when we remember that each of us is the face of God, it softens our edges. It creates the spaciousness for us to be more kind and to create more peace. And so today, my intention is to connect the ancient wisdom of Hinduism and kindness. And so I want to tell you this story that I love. Maybe some of you heard it. It just makes me giggle to think about it, actually. Uh, so it just went very viral. I, I, I saw it all over Facebook and social media, and I understand it was on Good Morning America. There was a woman from Florida who uh, <clears throat> had a little time before she had to pick up her, her kids from school. And uh, she went to the Wawa. I had to look that up in Florida, the Wawa. It's like a, it's a, it's a convenience store slash food market slash gas station. So she's hanging out in the Wawa before she's going to go pick up her kids. And she has just read an article about the magic of Christmas and the holiday season, and it totally inspired her. And she's feeling all the love and the joy, and she's in the Wawa. And there she is in line, and she is uh, getting ready to pay for her things, and she notices the woman behind her has some ginger ale. She turns to the woman and says, is that all you have, just ginger ale? And the woman says, yes. And she says, well, can I buy that for you? And the woman says, why? And she says, because I'm just feeling the magic of Christmas, and I just want to buy that for you. And the woman says, okay. And they have this really sweet, precious moment together. And she's walking out of the Wawa, and there she's going into the parking lot, feeling the love and the magic, and she sees a man cleaning the windshield of her car. And she goes running up to him, and she throws her arms around him. And she says, oh, the humanity. I love the humanity, the magic of Christmas. This is wonderful. I just love everything about what you're doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then she realizes he's cleaning his own car. <laughs> His car just looks just like hers, and hers is parked right behind him. Can you imagine? So she starts to laugh so hard that she can't even speak. So she laughs her way into her car, and she says she had to drive away and find another parking spot just to laugh, because she couldn't believe what she had just done. The thing is, here is the deal with this. I have a theory about why this story has gone viral so quickly. And that is that she has touched on something really important that we can all relate to. She had to make herself vulnerable to ask the woman behind her if she could pay for her ginger ale. And that woman 
had to make herself vulnerable to accept the gift of the ginger ale. And so, then of course she was just so thrilled and excited that she went and had that funny experience. But here's the thing, the shared experience of kindness requires vulnerability. The shared experience of kindness, think about it, it requires us to be vulnerable in many different degrees, but it requires that. So this week, I invite you to notice, just notice where you can let your guard down and you can be more vulnerable where you can let your guard down and be more vulnerable so that you may truly accept and take in the kindness of others. On that day in Chicago in September of 1893, Swami Vivekananda introduced one of the most important Vedic principles to the West, which is that the universe is one family the whole universe is one family. So let's remember this week to be kind to ourselves, to be kind to others, even if you hug a total stranger in the parking lot. <laughs> it's okay. I love you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, huh. thank you.